Namaste everybody. My name is Abhinav Kumar and I'm the host here today uh, for another session of Indica Conversation. And for that today we have uh, a Indic book reading session that we started uh, several months ago and we have been doing it. This is our third session I I think. Um, in in that uh, what we do is uh, pick up a couple of Indic books and then one of us do the presentation based on that so that's the format here so in for today's uh, presentation we have uh, nishant limbachia he will be talking about uh, uh, professor minakshi jain who is now also a uh, padma awardee recipient uh, right. historian par excellence and her work has been very widely acknowledged and received in the world uh of uh, not just the uh, not just the indic uh, system but also in history her book on ayodhya and sati and uh, flight of uh, deities they're all very very uh, exhaustive work that we have so nishant will be presenting on her book account of foreign travelers based on uh, her book based on the account of foreign travelers but before we do uh, we as we do always let's quickly start with uh, prayer ano bhadra kratavo yantu vishvatah may auspicious thoughts come to us from all over the world from all directions and with that i will quickly uh, like to read about a few lines about indica what we do here at indica so indica is a non traditional university for traditional knowledge we seek to build global renaissance based on indic civilizational thought we are 501c3 not for profit organization here in the us and all contributions made to it are tax exempt we uh, please visit our website at www dot indic academy all one word dot org explore navigate our activities platforms initiatives please also follow us on facebook twitter and instagram where we are at indic academy um with that i would like to introduce our co-hosts here uh, ram lakshman Ram Sundar Lakshmi Narayan. Hi, Ram. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ram. I am one of the uh, chapter coordinators for Indian Academy in Chicago. And also Nishant. Hi, Nishant. Namaste. Nishant here. Um, Nishant is also a chapter coordinator uh, plus presenter today. Uh, so why don't you tell us about us, Nishant? um yes let me first uh pull up my presentation i i closed it so i have to reopen it yeah we um, have we have known each other for for a while now and we have been working together here in chicago uh hosting right. a lot of programs and uh, talks and seminars and uh, you know we recently started doing right. this indica conversation because we couldn't go out so one day we were talking and i said hey why can't we do this so right. that's how this all this concept of indica conversation started right. and, and uh, we are uh, working on getting some more scholars or uh, speakers for the next few weeks and once uh, we have that information we'll pass it along to you so uh, through our you know social media platforms or whatsapp groups and things like that right um so namaste again everyone uh, nishant limbachia here um uh, quickly a, a couple of things about myself i i live in chicago been living here for a while with family work here and um been associated actually originally from gujarat uh, from vadodara and um uh, i happened to have a chance meeting with outans by about two and a half years back uh, and been in, involved with in indica since uh, like i often i said we are the three chapter coordinators we do other things um we're working all of them but then then we are 
on the side we're doing this uh, in our spare time and um, this is one of the uh, book reading sessions that we have this is the third one um, the first two um, were done by uh, Ram, Ram Sundar he uh, the first one was the critical uh, writings about India in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, we explored those. Um, then the second one was in February. The first one actually was in November last year. And the second one was in February. And that one was um, uh, decolonizing, uh, decolonizing Our Mind. And that was Dr. Conrad Elst's uh, book, um, Decolonizing the Hindu Mind. So um, this is the third kind of IBR. Um, and the, the third installment, so to speak, uh, and we're going to review um, two books, uh, if time permits. And uh, uh, I, I think I should be, we should be done, but uh, 45 minutes, uh, not 45 minutes, but uh, one hour, 15 minutes or so. And then we'll, we'll do some round table uh, q and I don't know if I can answer all the Q&As, but, you know, uh, we can do, you know, we can uh, take general comments. And that's how we are actually are. IBR session, sessions are basically what we do is we get together in a, in a room and, and kind of read the books. But because of this whole COVID situation now, that has gone out of the window. So now uh, we're all online virtually trying to review everything. So, um, yes. So on that, on that note, uh, I would uh, say that uh, if you have a questions or any comments to make, let's keep it uh, as a, uh, you know, informal as, you know, we, we, we would do in a regular book club meeting. So right. please, uh, you know, look for an opportune moment and raise your right. hand or unmute yourself and ask questions and show your face. If <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we have given you control about that. So without interrupting, if you can just come in and ask your questions sometimes and raise your hand that way we can unmute you too so let let's that uh, let that be the format for this uh, book reading session right nishanji yes okay all right um so with that let me share the, the presentation and we can get started um So everybody see my screen? Should I make it bigger? Um, let me see if I can make it bigger. Yeah, make it full screen. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So um, again, uh, we are going to. Uh, well, the title of the the talk this week is uh, our IBR session for for the third one is ancient and medieval historical writings about India, um, and uh, we all know. I mean, we've heard different stories and you know studied things in history, but um, these are the actual two books that we are going to review. Uh, the first one is actually from Sandhya Jainji. Um, she uh, edited it kind of thing, and which is the, uh, goes from lists accounts from uh, fifth century BC to the seventh century. And then the, the, the next one or the next three in series, there are actually four books in the series. The, this, the, on the one on the right is the second book we are going to uh, review, and that's the the foreign accounts from 8th to 8th to 15th century. And that is edited by Minakshi Jain. The, the remaining two are again edited by Minakshi Jain. Um, like Autan Bhai said, there she has she has done some wonderful work for the Indic you know, Dharmic uh, causes. Great books, um, uh, and I would recommend to kind of read some of those books, uh, if not this one. Um, you know, um, so. Um, so if I can quickly interject, if I'm not yeah. wrong, both Minakshi Janji yes. and Sandhya Janji are sisters. Yeah. Yes, they are sisters and, of the, yeah. And daughters of uh, late Sri Giridhari Lal Janji. Giri Lal Janji. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Let's see. So um, the first volume, uh, we are going to, um, uh, review and then let me give you a quick background and how this books came about or uh, all the four set of books came about. So um, the idea actually was came from late Sri uh, uh, Sir V. S. Naipaul, uh, um, the Nobel laureate, and passed away in uh, I mean passed away recently. I think 
But the idea came in 2004 when he actually traveled all around um, Indonesia and Cambodia and all those Far East countries and came back to India. And, and he was kind of in, um, he was kind of angry that, you know, uh, the India's culture was more, you know, kind of uh, talked about in those parts of the world rather than uh, being talked about here or, or in India in particular. So um, he got together with uh, various other scholars of those times, uh, Sandhya Jayanti and, and Meenakshi Jayanti took up the the, the bulk of the, the editing uh, of it. Some people, you know, kind of took away the, the financing and all, but they were actually, they kind of collected all the material and produced these four set of books. Um, so the idea here is to present the readers with a slice of ancient India and how it fascinated the many travelers that came to India. Um, yeah, these testimonies help piece together political, political history of those times. Um, now, why that is important? Because most of the Indian literature, literature at that time kind of portrayed history, morals, economics, law, you know, traditions, customs, uh, vyavahara, all sorts of vyavahara, in, in the four, uh, uh, you know, purusharkas, you know, dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. So um, all the stories that we've seen in Purana, I mean, it's all knowledge based on on telling you stories, you know, through a, or giving you the, the gnan through the stories. And most of the Greek travelers, and this is in particular, uh, relevant for the Greek traveler that came, right? that they were more interested in the political history because that's how they viewed history um, in, the West, uh, in the Western Hellenic world where um, um, they, they kind of viewed history as a you know, issue of governance, military techniques, tactics, warfare, geography, trade, etc. So uh, that's how they, they wanted to come here and kind of know that, that piece of history. Um, so uh, with uh, with that, you know, um, what happened is, you know, and I will explore the writings in in, in details. But um, with that in mind, and with that frame of mind of writing history, you know, Alexander when he when he came to India, invaded India, he brought his own chronicles, uh, chroniclers, uh, basically to write a history from his own perspective kind of uh, glorify his exploit, so to speak, and carry it forward back to the, to the Greeks. Um, so in, for, in, um, for that reason, there were a lot of facts and stories exaggerated. Uh, there was geography and customs were kind of misplaced and uh, misattributed. Uh, for example, the Ethiopian fable tales were sometimes said oh, they, are, they are from India. Uh, or, or even some of the Greek gods were transposed to India. You know, uh, they had visited India and they gave a religion there. And also, all just in the um, just as a way to kind of um, glorify the the Greek way of thought rather than the Indian way of thought. So, um, what what was written in those travel logs from the Greeks were a lot of things were exaggerated. So, what these books actually do is they they kind of separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, where they are, they removed all the unbelievable and fantastic stories that made no sense and probably were fake. And they only um, kind of took out the excerpts from the book which were relevant to our, to our, so to uh, describe our social life, political life uh, uh, and uh, teachings of those times or, or the way of life at that time. So. Um, well, I can't see any questions. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free. Uh, um, so um, uh, we'll begin, the first book actually um, uh, deals with the Greeks and Buddhists. So the first part, um, half of the book is um, all the Greek travels, um, uh, you know, and they, they list different travelers that came and then what they described and what was the life like in India at that time. And the subsequent part, um, um, rest half of the book, uh, even more than half, I would say 60% of the book, is devoted to uh, Buddhist travelers or uh, Chinese monks uh, that came from China uh, to learn about Buddhism. So uh, uh, to give you a quick outline and, and the way the book, this whole first book uh, is going to go, um, 
uh, we have the first, I mean, the first uh, noted um, trade or so to speak contact with Indians uh, is a trade with Phoenicians. And uh, if you want to look at Phoenicians, they are at the present day southeast coast of Lebanon. And um, as early as 975 BC. And we know that that's, that's probably right because um, we have uh, even older times in this valley civilization or the Saraswati Sindhu uh, you know, uh, uh, civilization that had uh, the, those industries that are found in Mesopotamia, uh, Mesopotamia uh, recently. I think uh, it's probably like one last 20 or 30 years. So, um, uh, then we have the visitors like Pythagoras that travel to India to study philosophy. Uh, we'll talk more about it later. Um, you know, people like Herodotus uh, and others wrote glowingly about India and what, what India stands for, and which eventually enticed Alexander to invade India in 326 BC. Um, he passed away in 323, uh, just three years after that. We'll, we'll, uh, get, we'll touch upon that um, a little later. And then uh, the most travel logs that we have are from uh, Nearchus, which was one of the Alexander's generals, and uh, Megasthenes. Uh, Megasthenes was um, 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 an ambassador uh, to Chandragupta Maurya's court, and he was actually way after Alexander passed away. So he, he, his kingdom had broken away, and uh, different you know regional uh, Greek rulers were there, and one of the rulers was. Uh, Nikator, uh, Seleucus Nikator, who was ruling in the present Afghanistan, Iran part. And he sent his ambassador to Patli, Patliputra, which is uh, what Chandragupta's uh, Rajdhani was. The, uh, and he traveled through uh, what we call the Uttarapatha, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later. Um, um, the Grand Highway, the Grand Trunk Road, which is what it used to call in the 19th century. Now it's uh, uh, um, um, Grand Trunk Road is what we used to call before the uh, before the uh, what do you call independence, um, and um, he traveled through that and he was there in Chandragupta's court uh, and he kind of reported what he saw um, and most of the subsequent Greek writers actually borrowed heavily from these two, so their works are now completely lost. We don't have them anymore, but the people who came right after them. Uh, like Strabo and, and others, Arian, they wrote uh, stuff based on Megasthenes' work. So we have indirectly his work and his words still preserved in a, in a way. Uh, so after, um, uh, after Megasthenes uh, and uh, and then when there was a brief period where there was really no, uh, so to speak, contact um, between India and Greece. And then until, um, ultimately Ptolemy, uh, who was again, another one of the regional generals uh, of Alexander that um, kind of established a dynasty in Egypt, uh, made a direct, con tried a direct contact with India in 115 BCE. Um, there is, there is a wonderful blurb in the book where Strabo, who is one of the his Greek historians, which we'll cover um, a little later on, uh, mentions about 120 ships sailing from the Egyptian coast to India. I mean, imagine 120 ships ready to sail, and this was a one year trip. So if they go one year, they come back. So they have 120 ships that are from Egypt, Egyptian coast, and then there probably equal number of ships that are on the Indian coast. And so they cross one another while going. So um, uh, by the time the Romans then, subsequently after that, by the time the Romans, the turn of the millennium captured power, there was a heavy sea trade uh, with India. Um, and um, uh, this continued till I think the fourth century CE, which is where I think the second or third century is probably more accurate, where it, kind of stopped the, the Greek influence or the Greek exploration of India pretty much stopped. And then uh, kind of the Buddhism uh, um, grew in, in, uh, in its influence. A lot of monks coming to India. Um, Ashoka's time, he was kind of sending out monks to, to even to Egypt and Greece. So 
Um, you could see, you know, a lot of influence up to until the Bamiyan Buddhas, for example, in Afghanistan. So our influence extended all, all the way, even, even more. Um, and then obviously the, after the rise of Islam in Arabia, uh, it was all uh, pushed back. So that's the general outline of the first book. So now we'll get into details um, of what the, each, each of the different travelers uh, um, kind of explored and what they, what they said um, in a little bit more detail. So uh, Nishant, I, I have a question from Man Manjula Ji before you go forward. Yes. yes. Do you be able to tell us what the Phoenicians were called in Sanskrit? Uh, no, I don't know what the Phoenicians were called in Sanskrit. Uh, maybe she knows. Uh, the book actually doesn't, and I haven't really uh, researched it. Uh, but if uh, there is a, I mean, if, uh, there is a mention of in King Solomon's Bible about uh, peacocks, ivories, and apes. So if you if you search that term, you would see a lot of Google hits, paintings, books by that name because those were the three big exports, so to speak, at that time. Uh, the, the, the Phoenicians had ordered those for King Solomon's court. Uh, court. That's what I uh, read okay. briefly through. Peacocks? What? Peacocks? Uh, yes, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Yeah, ivories, apes, and peacocks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, this brings us to the, the one of the very first uh, the kind of travelogues, uh, so to speak. Um, this was uh, written by Herodotus. Now, born he was they born before 490 BCE, and uh, it's generally credited as the father of history, um, at, at least the Western uh, context of history. And um, some of the important things that he kind of um, alluded out, uh, the, the the book actually mentions very little about him. It's only a few pages, but. It, it's it's kind of uh, uh, interesting to see what what they were actually doing at that time. So, imported Indian dogs in Babylon, which is the present day Iraq, um, somewhere in the middle of Iraq. Um, uh, vegetarian ethic of other Indians. Now, I the the book doesn't really explain what the other is, but uh, you can see they're they're eating vegetarian diet at that time, and this is recorded uh, through uh, Herodotus. Um, clothing from tree wool. Now, this is, uh, um, there is no um, clear uh, distinction whether this is really the tree wool or the, the wool from the, from the cotton plant that we, we know as of today, uh, which is more of a shrub. Um, uh, it used to be a tree wool where they used to make mattresses out of and, and saddles for horses and stuff like that. So uh, that's being recorded and that's what that's what, what was traded uh, um, and being uh, attributed generally or people are wearing that. So um, then he mentions the army of Xerxes, the first Persian empire with Indians wearing garments of tree wool again, carrying bows, iron tipped arrows, um, riding horses, chariots drawn by horses and biomass. Now, uh, if we had read this a few years ago, we would, we would be accused like, oh, there was no chariots, right? And all the leftists would say, oh, there were no chariots. But then the recent discoveries in Sonali, um, if you are following all that, uh, you would see that they have found out chariots with the wheels and then uh, the wheels are kind of coated with the copper plates. So um, a lot of that is uh, may have been, uh, uh, so to speak, of fantastic tales at that time or, or maybe even a, two centuries ago, which is not anymore because now we are trying to, we are finding out all this different stuff from archaeological digs and all that. So, um, all right. so uh, the next uh, uh, person or the next historian, so to speak, or travelogue that we are going to explore is um, that of uh, uh, Theseus. And he was a physician in, in Darius's two's court. So this is Darius II was the, the, was the emperor uh, reigning in uh, Persia, uh, or present-day Iran, and he actually wrote a book called Indica, which is I when I read it I was laughing, uh, uh, but um, he he wrote in, in uh, Indica because he collected reports. And now he never traveled to India, so to speak, because he was a physician, and he uh, I think he spent about 18, 19 years 
in Darius's court being a physician. But what he did was um, every time somebody came from India and there was an active exchange between India and Iran at that time, uh, whenever somebody came from India, he would just simply go uh, check on the person, ask what, what he saw and what he, you know, what they, what they experienced and all that. So, um, uh, so and, and again, only a, a few parts of it remain anymore. I mean, we don't have the, the entire writings of him, but um, the, for some of the few things that he mentioned was um, justice and crime, how uh, the Indians love, have a sense of justice where they would not go and conquer other land and their, the, 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 the spread of dharma, so to speak. Where they would they would not go out and and uh, conquer other land and there is a certain sense of uh, crime and um, there is no basically no sense of uh, crime in the in the population and then how they um, uh, treat each other. So um, and being a physician again, um, he inquired a lot about Indians' health. So they he said they they don't have any kind of diseases, they don't have any uh, physical problems, they live a very long life. Um, you know, the way they dress, for example, like they, they die, used to dye their clothes um, in different colors. Uh, they used to dye their hair in, in beard. So it, this is all the fashion kind of coming back. Now people are dyeing their head, uh, hairs purple and all that. That's all uh, uh, was there before. It's all coming back. Um, Wanted to say something, by? Oh, I thought. No. Okay. Um, uh, the third and uh, the big, uh, the third uh, Greek historian or geographer that we are going to talk about is Strabo. Um, now, this one kind of goes in, in a lot of detail, other than than the, the previous two, and uh, he lived in the first century CE, so right up, uh, way after Alexander and and Megasthenes uh, and all that. Again, he never visited India, but then he used all those writings that other people had, like Megasthenes and Nurtures had, and he kind of compiled and put together. So uh, uh, one of the things that he describes is um, uh, people near Amritsar, again, uh, using uh, clothing dyed and hair dyed. Um, he talks about medicinal plants, all that stuff. He talks about sugar cane which is, was fascinating everybody. And this was even fascinating to the Greek uh, Buddhists that came after us. So um, uh, I was researching this, and I, I think I've seen that, uh, I don't know if you have seen that infographic where uh, sugar is mentioned uh, with its different names in different parts of the world and how it, it came out to be known as a sharkara, which the, the Sanskrit word is sharkara, and then it's called shakkar. And, uh, from Khanda, it's called in Gujarati, it's, it's called Khand, and you know all the different names that that you know uh, sugar has are all different variations, and you could identify them. Um, so uh, that was that was something interesting. Um, he talks about uh, the spices and the kushta grass. So um, again, we know about about the spice trade and all that. Um, Kushta grass is something that I, I recently learned and I, I was trying to figure out what that really was. And if you know, you know, like if, you, if you've seen the old village beds, you know, like the, uh, where you know, something called the khat or khatia, where they, they uh, put the strings together and make a, you know, make a bed out of it. That's the kushta grass. So um, I remember my, um, um, I remember my, um, elder uncle, my dad's bigger brother, elder brother, um, telling me about how they used to make the ropes for the beds uh, in the gang, in the villages. And that kind of tradition has, was still there um, until what, 30 or 40 years ago, that people were making them uh, within the villages and putting, you know, beds and all that and it was ultimately exported. So you can even still even find those costa grass ropes uh, in, in the markets if you go in India. So that's been such a long uh, tradition of uh, exporting and using that. Yeah, I remember those those carts with my grandfather. Right. I, I've, I've done several of them. 
<laughs> right? They, my uncle actually uh, to, uh, like to, literally explained to me how they used to make that. So yeah. it was like a very long process. You have to cut them, uh, you know, bring them, dry them, you know, wet them with water, and then twist them until they become like a, a string. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. And my grandfather never slept on a chowkey. You know what yeah. a chowkey is. So he always will sleep on that cot with, yeah. the, with the string wala. Right. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that he talks about, um, Strabo talks about, is the wealth of sin. Now, obviously, um, by that time, uh, we had we were way past the Sindhu Saraswati's, you know, the, all the, the civilization kind of melted away. But still, Sindh was very, very prosperous, and even prosperous during the, the times when the Subsequently, when the the Arabs came, so um, um, it kind of um, tells you the the way things were and, and what we know about them kind of reinforces our understanding of those things. Um, uh, then Strabo actually goes ahead and and references Megasthenes' work of social classification, and we we call it caste now because his work. This work that was in Greek was translated in 1979 by by a, by a gentleman. Um, so um, he obviously translated it in class caste, but I don't think the word caste existed at that time. So it was more like a social class of Warna, what you speak, what do you call it? Um, uh, we had the, he describes about seven different classes of people: uh, philosophers, um, farmers. Uh, shepherds and hunters, traders, fighting men, inspectors, counselors, and accessors. So they all had different, uh, uh, you know, uh, roles in society, obviously. And um, he kind of says that there was there was the husbandmen or the farmers were the only ones who were exempt from kind of the military service. Um, I mean, others can can be employed in the military service, but the farmers were the ones who were completely exempted from military service and would never be harassed, so to speak, when the two armies are fighting against each other. So you could have complete peace, no famines, no nothing. Uh, farmers can continue their work uh, even while their respective countries are kind of fighting. So. Um, the, the next, uh, I mean, the, the, the further he goes on, Strabo goes on to talk about um, uh, Shramanas and Brahmanas, you know, the two, two different sects of, uh, uh, so to speak, the philosophers. Um, he, he mentions the women studying philosophy. And this is, uh, he describes a system of Gurukula where, you know, they are all staying together and um, studying. And, and we often hear that you know, women, women did not have equal status in the Vedic times and you know, all the leftists, you know, you would, if you read their literature, it's all full of that. But here we have a first hand account of people actually saying that the women used to study philosophy and um, there were not that many of them, but still they were, whoever was willing to study, they were allowed to study, so to speak. Um, 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 and then he actually then the then he this travel kind of goes and talks about um, all the conquests that uh, Alexander did, um, various uh, cities and he went and fought and all that stuff. Uh, how he interacted with the local people and one of the stories is where he asks uh, certain Brahmins to uh, come to him or Shramanas to come to him and explain to him what their religion was all about. And so um, shamanas respond to him like, we don't need to explain our religion to you. If you need to know, you should come to us. So Alexander would say, well, I'm, I'm the, the great king and I've conquered everything, I can't go to you. So he kind of sends his deputy like, hey, you know, go and talk to them and see what they have to say and come and report back to me. Um, and what he reports back is what you get you know, you hear the glimpses of Vedanta in it, uh, right? Uh, the soul um, kind of is immortal, so to speak, and uh, concept of Brahman and Panchitattva, earth being spherical, 
you know, control your senses and mind. Um, and when when the the deputy hears all this, right, he's he reminds himself of Pythagoreanism. Now, Pythagoreanism was a sixth century BC uh, kind of sect or pantha in Greece, where it was started by Pythagoras, which we you know the Pythagoras theorem, right? Um, he started this sect where he would was again he was totally against uh, any kind of animal or uh, meat eating so completely vegetarian and he believed in reincarnation so uh, the book doesn't really go into the fact that oh whether he borrowed it from india or not but we can put two and two together kind of and see how you know those teachings kind of reached him um, and he believed in all that and so that we remembers that and he says oh we we had somebody like this that who, who talked about it and um, it still talks about it. So they, by that time, uh, by Alexander's time, uh, they were, the, the sects were still there. And then after, by the time Strabo was writing about them, the, those sects were completely gone. So they lasted for about 600 years or so. Um, the next uh, travelogue um, is by Pliny. Now, Pliny is, was a Roman statesman and author of natural history. Um, very little is mentioned him in the book about the book, but in, in the book about him. Uh, but he mentions like various wildlife, you know, floras and everything. So most of the book, some of the parts of the book are all describing the various trees and you know flora and fauna, which I really didn't find uh, that interesting. Um, uh, but the one of the lines that that is mentioned in the in the book and is attributed to him is his uh, complaint in the Roman Senate uh, on how Romans were completely dependent on India to export luxury items um, to them uh, to them and they was um, having a very huge uh, drain on the treasury of the Romans so um, Pliny by his own estimates, 100 million sesterces of Roman treasure makes way to India every year. Now, uh, sesterces is more, more like a quarter, um, a silver quarter, so to speak. Uh, so one fourth of their uh, main currency. But 100 million is a big number and, and kind of um, um, reflects the views of Strabo where he said there are 120 ships uh, going from Egypt to India. So you could see the amount of trade and you know the amount of wealth transfer that was happening from Europe um, or the, from the Roman Empire to the to India. Okay. Um, the next travelogue um, we have um, is Arian. Now this one is more about Alexander's campaign rather than anything else. Um, and he wanted to write Indica, which was a previous book, um, um, Sistis wrote, which, which he wanted to kind of supersede and write another book, uh, but wasn't really successful. So he incorporated some of it and, and made another book called Indica. Um, and in this, he actually uh, mentioned the conquest, the different cities, how, how the armies were, of the different towns and cities that Alexander encountered, and then obviously it comes to the Battle of uh, Poros with the Poros, and then how they are called Poros in the in the ancient times, uh, and how he there was a battle, and killed twenty thousand infantry, three thousand cavalry, and Poros' two sons. Poros was captured. We all know that story. Um, what happens after that is kind of interesting, and there is one line actually. Uh, that caught my attention. That's why I mentioned it here. Uh, that right after Poros is uh, defeat, and he kind of talks to Poros, and he gives back all his, uh, you know, uh, empire back to uh, to land and to Poros. Um, his uh, Alexander's army revolts, and he says they were not going any further. You know, because we've heard Magadha has uh, hundred thousand elephants, so we're not we're not going for any further. We don't want to get slaughtered. Uh, you know, we're tired. We want to go home. So um, there is a huge dialogue between uh, uh, Alexander and his, one of his, and his generals and Alexander is adamant like, no, 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 no. I promised myself I'm gonna conquer the world. I'm gonna go to the end of India and, and conquer everything. And the generals are saying, 
uh, you are not we were not doing that the, the forces are not ready for it so he the one of the generals kind of set, says a very good line in the end that says self-control in the midst of success is the noblest of all virtues which is where um, you find the reflection of indian thought um, so that was really interesting for me to read that um we've uh, we've covered that indians do not invade other nations um, uh, the um, the thing that he uh, kind of recorded is no monuments for dead uh, but we follow virtues and sing praise or you know, preserve memory which is what um we used to do uh, now that there is the, now we've kind of gone down in that tradition but we used to follow that tradition for a long long i think uh, um, up, until, up until we were um, uh, we attained independence from the British. We were kind of following more or less to the same uh, tradition of uh, remembering our heroes through uh, their stories and their songs. Um, okay. um, marriages, again, uh, without we, without any give or take of dowry, um, and then the concept of swam work, which we all know. Uh, Uh, the next comes the, the 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 book of life of Apollonius, right? So he um, this was Apollonius was a saint, and Philostratus was the one who wrote the book about two hundred years after his death. So um, life of Apollonius was was uh, it's a very actually pretty good read within the book, and how he, his early life where he was more of a follower of Pythagorean philosophy. So he would, he would not, he would against animal sacrifices, right? He was believer in, you know, um, reincarnation and all that. Um, and in, in those times, uh, they had, uh, he was branded as an antichrist by, by, the, by the new up and upcoming religion called Christianity, right? So um, uh, there, is a, there is an interesting uh, paragraph in the book where they, they say how, you know, Apollonius was kind of, uh, greater in the in doing his ability to do miracles rather than and then Jesus Christ and so uh, the earlier the churches refused to kind of acknowledge that he was kind of at least unequal to Jesus Christ and um, they eventually demoted him to a lower saint and so he 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 gets his place uh, in the church but not as high as Jesus and his. Uh, Represented some of the iconography of, of the churches, and, and I was surprised to know that he then goes into the Arab mythology as the uh, kind of the master of talismans or the, uh, you know the black magic or you know taviz vidya whatever you want to call it. So um, um, interesting part. So Apollonius um, uh, traveled to India. To debate, and he traveled to India, and he kind of uh, uh, to kind of know more about the Pythagorean philosophy that he was following. So he said, "I'll go to the land where Pythagoras learned about all this, and I want to experience it my first hand." He went there. He came to India. Um, he is greeted by uh, he goes to Taxila, Taxasila, and then when when he actually is um, trying to look for uh, holy men, wise men, or sadhus. Uh, he's brought to people who are actually speaking Greek and who are uh, completely kind of Indianized in a way that they are talking about Indian philosophy and all that. So he, he debates with them. Um, he stays for four or five months. Um, he, and most of the chapter is all about um, the wisdom and, you know, uh, the Indian thought that he kind of takes away with him. And then eventually he goes to Egypt uh, where he debates with Egyptians who think Nile is their god because they are again, we, this is again coming back to the pagan culture where, or so to speak, quote unquote, pagan culture where um, the native cultures kind of um, uh, worship uh, the symbols that they have. So the Egyptians used to worship Nile. So he goes and, and talks to Egyptians um, and gives them the thought, uh, the Indian thought. So. But those were wise men who were actually uh, Greeks, but uh, who who had been Indianized. Is that what you're saying? 
Yes, uh, and uh, yes and no. So some of them were you know, Greeks were Indianized. Some were uh, some were some learned the language because the Greek uh, the Greek world was at the frontier, right? So it was right, right at the border of uh, Greece, uh, Greek kingdom and the Indian side. So um, they learned the language. So the book that actually doesn't specify, but I from what I've learned and what I've read, different things they were a mix of both. So they were Greeks who were um, who have completely Indianized and who were uh, you know expounding the, the Indian philosophy and there were Indians who, who learned Greek because the closeness to the, the Greek empire, so to speak, at that time. Okay. Since, we, since we're talking about uh, uh, Pythagoras' theorem, I, I happened to read uh, uh, wor uh, some work by Dr. Manjul Bhargav mm -hmm. in the context of uh, the theorem itself. Right. Okay, and he says, while, uh, and I quote, while talking about Pythagoras theorem and its origin in 2500 BCE in Egypt, Dr. Bhargav, the Fields Medal winning mathematician from Princeton University once said, there is no statement of the theorem anywhere, but there is some knowledge. Okay, so people could know what it is, but it was not formalized. Right. right? right. However, the Pythagorean theorem first occurs about 800 BCE in India's Shilba Sutra of mm -hmm. Althayan. So that needs to be cleared that, okay, I mean, people may have some, you know, fragmented knowledge about some things here, some things there, and right, they may have right. done something, but formulation as it is comes from Shilba Sutra. Right. This is, I'm quoting Dr. Maljun Bharga. Right, right. Actually, and, no, uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. It is supposed to be Bhaskara's work. Okay, I'm I'm quoting Dr. Bhargav, Maljul Bhargav. So no, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, so I don't know much about it. So, yeah. Manjula, you are saying it is Bhaskara's work? Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. And I can actually uh, pull up some, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, please paste it, copy paste some of the references if you should want. To I don't it. have it offhand, but I can pull it up and then email it to you. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. I'm not doubting anything. I'm just, uh, you know, I read it somewhere, so I have it handy, available. So I'm just okay. quoting Dr. Bhargo. The, the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, after Pythagoras' death, his, his, uh, his pantha, so to speak, the sect was kind of, kind of split into two. One was more into uh, worship, another was more into mathematics. So one sect was completely into mathematics, other one was in completely into kind of, so to speak, adhyatma or uh, worship. So, um, wow. And, and, and I, I, there is, I mean, I don't want to plug Wikipedia here, but if you go out and search for it, you will find a lot of references to Pythagorean theory, you know, uh, uh, thought and how it, it um, um, influenced the other later uh, philosophical thought schools that came up in Greece after that. So, um, so with that, uh, I think uh, we're coming to the end of the Greek part, but uh, one last bit, um, um, what Alexander witnessed was Indian women's valor. Now, this, there's a brief, brief story of how um, Alexander kind of accepted a surrender for, from, from, from a kingdom and did not honor the surrender and uh, kind of attacked and and even the women were fighting uh, side by side men uh, with their swords drawn uh, with Alexander's men. So he he witnessed that and and his chroniclers actually witnessed that and and he um, it was written in the books. Um, I alluded earlier to this the respect to farmers and nature during war. So um, they obviously they were never touched. Um, no land was burnt, uh, no, nothing was burnt, right? No, the farmers were not disturbed. That was the dharmic uh, or dharma um, that was followed during, for even during the uh, war times. And that's why we, we saw no famines. I mean, Greeks write about continuously about abundance of food, no famine, no nothing, you know, and all that. And this literally changed after um, the Arabs came. So we'll get to it. Uh, because their kind of modus operandi was to burn everything, right? Um, um, fair treatment of 
foreigners and uh, no considerable ill will towards the Greeks um, because obviously the Greeks did not come all the way to India. They were kind of at, at the periphery of India. So, but even still, they did not have any considerable ill will um, that, that the Greeks experienced amongst the Indians for themselves. So um, in the end, actually, um, the, the book um, kind of goes into detail, uh, which was fascinating for me uh, for various reasons. So it lists all the things that were sent from India, exported out of India, right? And they were exported out of different places. Um, well, um, they actually even have a book, even actually prints a manual or so or, or not a manual, but a contract between Roman merchants uh, in Kerala that how they are going to conduct the business, who is going to take care of what part of uh, the business or, you know, journey, uh, who is going to unload, who's going to, uh, you know, take the, the materials further, so to speak. So it's, it's a fantastic read. So um, quickly, um, ghee, red coral, silk, Sugar um, uh, silk thread. I, uh, that's that's a that's a mistake here. Silk thread, sugar, uh, spike nard uh, from Kambat, which is Kambe, which used to be called Kambe, now Kambat, which is in Gujarat. Um, evidently, this is not really far from Lothal, which was um, a port town in the Saraswati Sindhu civilization. So um, uh, we have red corals going from Baruch. Again, in Gujarat, uh, which was the other side of uh, Kambe. Um, red corals, Koshta Grash, uh, sugar, Chinese heights first from Karachi. Um, Karachi, you know, present day Karachi was called Debal at that time um, uh, from Devale because there was a mandir there and then the port came around that. So um, it used to, they, they used to have a uh, lot of trade from that side. Uh, Red uh, corals, pearls, peppers from Kerala, uh, uh, and then uh, aloe from Socotra. So um, this is interesting. When I was searching about this, so, so Socotra is a very small island just east of Yemen. Uh, uh, if you look in Google Maps, you'd see Socotra Island. Now, Socotra Island. Uh, has a very curious connection with Gujarat and because I am from Gujarat, I know this, where um, there is a uh, uh, roop of Shakti or Mata, which is called uh, Sikotar Mata. So Sikotar Mata comes actually from Sokotra because, and she's kind of uh, uh, shown as a, uh, uh, a Devi of, uh, you know, what we call Wahan or uh, ship, right? So Devi of ships. So uh, you could imagine the connection between Sokotra because they were constantly going back and forth between Sokotra and coming back. So they used to you know, call upon the Devi and say, okay, you know, bless doing our, um, give us our Shirwa during our journey and all that. So that's a, that's a very interesting uh, connection that I, I found out uh, while reading this. Um, with that, um, the Greek uh, travelogues are pretty much done. Um, uh, we can move to the Buddhist travelogues. So, um, what we well, I can give you a quick overview of what um, the, the Buddhist travelers experienced, and then we can go in detail about um, what the what each of them said. We are only going to see only going to um, uh, ex uh, explore three three Greek right or uh, three. Buddhist travelogues, um, we all know their names, so Hiran Sang, Fahen, and Yip Singh. So um, I'll, I'll quickly let me run through these, and uh, we have what, well, 15, 20 minutes to go. I don't know if you can uh, do that, but we'll quickly run through them. So, um, sea voyages and commercial ties between China and India go back to the 7th century BC. Uh, there were colonies of Indian merchants in Cambodia, Java, and Sumatra. Um, uh, second century BC, Chinese works refers to as the Antu or Nintu, uh, which is Hindu, and Shinto, which is Sindhu. Um, and um, Buddhism expanded into, in, into China during the Ashoka's um, rule, and we all know that. Uh, let me quickly go through. Um, so the main exposition of the Buddhist travelers was to translation of sutras and texts in Chinese. So that was their main 
kind of occupation of the Buddhist uh, monks there. Um, one of the first ones um, that traveled to China and translated about five texts was Kashyap Matanga. Uh, and then, then there's various translations in 150 CE, 200, uh, 250, 260, 300. Uh, and then the final, I think, Dharma Rakshaka. Raksha was translated about 165 texts uh, around 300 CE. So all the Chinese travelers actually come after this. Uh, um, so um, um, the Buddhist uh, uh, the Buddhist monks or the Chinese travelers, so to speak, came uh, arrived in India mainly to learn about Buddhism. So um, finding out authentic books about uh, Buddhism and proper Buddhist discipline, what's the the way to do the, uh, the dhyana or sadhana. Um, after, so uh, we'll quickly skip and I'll, I'll give you a quick overview. So Fahen was the first one who came uh, to India um, and subsequent to his death, uh, Buddhism fell into like the mystic arts, um, after which about 200 years later, Huen San came to India, which we all know about his name about, um, and then after that, um, uh, there's various uh, quick tidbits, uh, but it Singh came after that. And then I think after that, there was a cessation of uh, any travel logs from, in, from China to India. So um, we, we see uh, Emperor Ik Sung learning Sanskrit, uh, Koreans and Japanese actually making trips to China to learn, uh, to get the texts that the Chinese have brought from India. Um, and I was, I was, I read it actually, but I did not really believe. But the book mentions Kublai Khan, um, a Deva Buddhist, uh, was presented a translation of Buddhist text, which, which was way in the time of the, the Islamic invasion when the Islamic invasion were um, quite prevalent in India. So, um, um, let's move to Fahen. So, to Fahen was the first one. Um, one of the first travelers that uh, we have who have left extensive records of his travel um, and what he experienced in India. Um, he came because his guru kind of ex um, uh, wanted him to explore more Buddhist texts, get authentic texts, learn practices of Dharma. And so he, along with the four monks, um, around 300, 400 CE, he spent, uh, came to India, spent 15 years in travel. Um, so. Uh, it's interesting to know each uh, traveler's uh, the way or the or the the way they came through India. So um, Fahen actually came from uh, the uh, Xinjiang, uh, which is uh, present-day China, um, Kabul, North India, and then went to Patliputra, and then went to Bengal and Sri Lanka, and then from South China Sea even went back to China. So kind of did a huge circle if you. Uh, can imagine. Um, and um, all of his companions died before he left. So he, he came out with us, all the four months that he came to travel with, died. So uh, and he left India. Um, so he mentions uh, Buddhism being practiced. So when he started his travel, he obviously he kind of crossed the Gobi and came into the, the Uyghur country, what we call the Xinjiang. Um, and he uh, describes how Buddhist practices and devalas were there everywhere he went. So he would see stupas, you know, sangha aramas, or uh, you know, uh, travel uh, places for or the lodging places for the the bhikshus, right, or, or the monks. Um, I was fascinated to know that there was a rathyatra. Uh, um, he witnessed a rathyatra in the present day Hotan which is north of Aksai Chin, right in the middle of Xinjiang. Uh, he, noted, he kind of, um, people are dragging a huge chariot with the uh, Murti of Buddha and then um, the other devs uh, sitting right next to him. And his whole procession is carried through the, the town and you know the king comes uh, you know, barefoot and kind of uh, welcomes the, the Ratha and all that. So, uh, very, very interesting to know that. Um, obviously, he goes around and finds out, I mean, he writes about Hindu temples and Sanghāramas. Most of the stuff that they wrote uh, was more Buddhist-centric. So they, they went to places and wrote about 
the Buddhist practices happening there, you know, what they saw and what, what kind of text they can gather. So they did not write much about the social life, so to speak, of the Indians. Uh, that was more done by the Greeks. Um, and um, these were more focused on the religion part of uh, the practice part of uh, Buddhism. Um, so just some of the places that uh, Fahen visits, uh, Mathura, Kapilavastu, Lumini, you know, you know, we all know that Kanoj, Kashi, Kosala, Sarnath, uh, Patliputra, Nalanda, Tamralipti. Tamralipti is the, the port that he went out from, from Bengal, which is uh, uh, present day uh, near Kolkata. Um, and again, he witnesses a Rathyatra in Patliputra. So same Rathyatra that pretty much the same Rathyatra that he witnessed in Hotan, he witnesses again uh, in uh, Patliputra. So you can see the extent of uh, in the thought uh, spread around a huge uh, geographical location. Um, while all his travels, so he travels from uh, uh, Kabul and from from uh, the Caucasus in Kabul and all the way to, to Patliputra, he doesn't really get much of the te uh, text that he's looking for. Most of the practices are, are oral or done under a Guru Sishya Parampara kind of thing. And so when it comes to Patliputra, that's when he kind of fi uh, you know, finds some of the texts that he's looking for. So he spends three years in Patliputra, gets lots of texts, um, learns Sanskrit, and then from Patliputra, he travels to Tamralipti, which is the, the port near Kolkata, present-day Kolkata, um, and travels to or sails to Sri Lanka. Um, and he spends two years there. Um, and collects some more manuscripts and then he travels back the return journey. Um, the, the important, I mean, the, the, um, and I, I love trees, so I'm, I'm, I'm more of a tree lover. So I, people is one of my favorite trees. So I found out that uh, there's a huge old tree in uh, present day Anuradhapura, uh, which is in Sri Lanka, which is about 2,500 years old or 25, yeah, 2,500 years old tree. And it was actually brought from Patliputra. So uh, he, he records that fact that one of the kings actually brought a branch of from Patliputra all the way to Sri Lanka and, and planted there and became that, that tree that we see in Anuradhapura today. And I think the, I think uh, the story is that the uh, Ashoka's son, when he went to Sri Lanka, he mm. took a sapling right. of the tree that Bhagwan Buddha meditated under. Right. Okay. So right. he took it there. So uh, the, the the tree in Sri Lanka is the original sapling there. Right. But then during the, you know, uh, I think Islamic invasion, that the original tree that is in Bodh Gaya, that was in Bodh Gaya, was cut. Mm. Okay, and then, but then it a sapling for the original sapling was uh -huh. brought back, and so the tree that you see is the sapling of the uh, uh, Bodhgaya thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. if I'm not mistaken. Right. Okay. Mm. That's interesting. So um, his return journey, Fahin's return journey, was also uh, very very interesting. So he traveled from Sri Lanka to Java, and while traveling, they they heard uh, they. Uh, they got in, into a hurricane, a uh, typhoon. So uh, most of the stuff, um, they had, I mean, and the boat started leaking. So uh, they had to throw a lot of stuff overboard. So all the people were throwing their stuff because they didn't want the boat to sink. Uh, so when uh, Fahen's turn came, he said, I'm not going to throw away any of my books because I worked so hard for them to acquire them. I'm not going to throw away any of the books. So, so, that, so they said, well, what are you going to throw? So he kind of, Throw, threw away all his personal belongings, including the, the vessel or the pot that he used to drink water from. So um, eventually they were, uh, the typhoon kind of passed away and they, they landed in Java and then they, he stayed there for I think for a few months and then he again uh, did his onward journey to, to China and they were again uh, uh, into a typhoon kind of thing where, um, so all the, um, all the, uh, Boatmen, and they, they started saying that this guy is unlucky. And, uh, you know, every time he sets, steps in a boat, you know, um, there is a typhoon. So the next island that we are going to see is we're going to drop him over there and not worry about him. So uh, 
his dhanapati the, uh, the person who is uh, um, we don't know much about him but the person who is sponsoring finds return journey is also traveling with him and he says no you know uh, if you if you uh, this is against the dharma so if you if you drop him you might as well drop me and with that all your um, you know uh, expenses that are being paid will also vanish so they say okay well okay then we will we'll not drop him and eventually he reaches uh, uh, china and then uh, is welcome obviously he starts translating some of his work um, and um, he he kind of writes his whole travel on that's how uh, interesting journey uh, very very fascinating to read about all that and um if you if you know i mean if you want to read about it there there is a great book by uh, um uh, sanjeev sanya uh, which is um, the land of the seven rivers and the ocean of churn so if you if you read those two the fire Fah hands journey is also mentioned in those books um, on how what uh, what he uh, experienced um, i just put that thing in the text there okay. <laughs> yeah well, i i read those two books and they, they i mean they they are they are such great i mean they they're so nice to read i mean um excellent excellent books to read um so um the next um, travel log and and then one of the biggest ones in the whole book is a uh, hyun san we we um we diff we pronounce it different ways but it's all hyun san and um a uh, book devotes about 100 pages to his travels alone and again most of the travels are on 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 his buddhist uh, you know exploring his buddhist uh, disciplines and and what he can do and where he goes around in the in, in the entire india so um, a desire to see, uh, see and worship sacred land yogachara bhum uh, that's how india is known in uh, china at that time yogachara bhum collect buddhist sutras and study the depth of buddhist philosophy um so he traveled to india between uh, 629 and 643 ce is what 14 years or so um, and studied yogachara saraswati vada saravasti vada a madhyamika logic grammar vedas and became proficient so proficient that he could he could uh, expound the philosophy um, both of the vedas and of the um, buddhist philosophies and he could debate with the uh, you know various uh, other people and, and there is a there is a beautiful incident uh, that I'll narrate uh, shortly so um he came back about 657 words and translated about 75 of them during his lifetime um, most of the stuff is then he kind of the chinese made a monastery for him and he was uh, put monks to translate a lot of his uh, work after his death um um his travels uh hyun san's travel prompted a larger diplomatic contact between india and china um, um the he introduced the chinese to the sugar uh, technology uh, granules again khanda uh, sharkara khanda uh, developed by india wrote in the, uh, wrote about details about measures of land astronomy how you know what things are and we all know about that um and then one of the things that he writes is uh, contradicts the popular view that indians don't have a written history so he finds out that uh, the towns are uh, each town is maintaining a log of good and bad events so uh, you know what happened and what was good and what was bad every town is recording that so we have this um, um, notion that oh you know indians were not uh, doing any kind of history or writing history that's not true uh, so um the most fascinating thing that i found out in the book is when he describes the education of young in india and he kind of uh, brings forward uh, what we call the the way the way to teach kids and and i think there are some lessons for us um, in in the present day as well um, while well, we all know in our like indian education system is um, so much behind in all anglicized so to speak so uh, we have to uh, this kind of gives us a glimpse of what it was before um, children were which in our first thought siddha was to at the 12 uh, 12 12 chapters uh, i think this was more like a kind of panchatantra uh, story of morals and then once they are seven and up they are taught the five vidyas the, the shabda vidya the etymology or you know how the shabdas are made 
uh, silpasthana vidya, which is uh, architectural, you know, way to construct the vedis or way to construct mandirs, uh, chikitsa vidya, which is, uh, you know, medicine, you know, how you cure yourself, ketu vidya, the cause and effect, like what causes uh, dukkha, what causes sukha, and, and what you can do, uh, what are the, how to analyze a certain situation, and then adhyatma vidya. So, uh, Fascinating, fascinating stuff. I mean, there are a lot of lessons for us, uh, for even this, for this generation. So, um, fascinating read. Um, uh, let me quickly run through. He goes to different places. I know he visits the places that Farhan visited. You know, uh, Sangarams. He mentions Devalas in Kashi and all that. Uh, he spent uh, five, uh, Hyun San actually spent five years in Nalanda. So, so he spent five years under a guru. Uh, Srila Bhadra mastered non Buddhist texts, Veda, the astronomy, you know, medicine, geography, mathematics. And then um, um, on his return journey, um, he now obviously is a homesick, so he wants to go back. So he, he goes through the Sun Temple in Multan. So there used to be a huge Sun Temple in Multan, everybody knows about it. Uh, if you guys don't know, you can search for it. But uh, used to be a huge Aditya Mandira in, in Multan, and eventually he um, does a big debate in Prayag uh, before actually going to Multan. Um, and on his back journey, he actually goes back from the same route he came. So when he actually came out of China, he did not take the permission of the, the emperor. So in, in those days, it was customary that you have to take the emperor's permission if you want to go out of the country. So he kind of snuck out from there, from China, without telling anybody. So now when he's going back, he's writing letters um, to the Chinese emperor that, hey, I'm coming and I have acquired all these different texts and please allow me an entry back into China. Um, interesting is when he crosses over from Indus and he's crossing the Indus and going back from the same route he came, uh, he loses some of his books and the, the boat kind of overturns and some of his books flow away in the river. So uh, some of the monks are traveling with him. So he sends the monks back to India, to other side of the Indus, to the Indian side. And he requests them to make copies of the books that he has lost. So he's, uh, he said, uh, he was, Hyun stays on one side of the Indus waiting for the uh, monks to arrive back with the new copies of the books that he, which, which he can take back. Um, obviously, he then later on, then he takes all the stuff back. Uh, the emperor kind of makes a monastery for him. He begins his translation work. And, in, and 10 years later, while he's still in China, he's, he's doing his translation work, he receives a letter from two of his uh, fellow monks from India saying, you know, uh, we, we, uh, we just wanted to see how you're doing. And, you know, when are you coming back, if ever? And Hyun Sang says, I'm too old, I can't come back, but uh, I'm sending you the list of books that you can send me. So even when, even in that time, I mean, he's still thinking about getting more books um, uh, from India. So, so I, I keep, I, I think uh, Zai, we, we talk about a lot about uh, this um, India being the, the knowledge export, you know, like the, our biggest export was knowledge. Um, all this stuff that, that uh, gets exported like spices and peppers. All this came after our first our knowledge actually traveled outside, and our um, and then on the coattails of this knowledge came all the products that we had to sell. So uh, pretty much what uh, what is the story of America as well, right? So, I mean, uh, knowledge is knowledge based economy here, and that's why it attracts a lot of people. And then how the American culture kind of disseminates uh, uh, everywhere. Um, every part of the world. So, 15 minutes, huh? I, I think we might, we might even really do a couple more, a uh, few more slides. Let's see. Um, uh, so, um, the last travelogue that we are going to focus on is um, the travelogue from Ed Singh. So, he traveled about 200 years after um, not not 200 years after, but uh, 30, 40 years after uh, Hyun Sang uh, came in. So 671 CE and he stayed for about 20, 25 years. Uh, 
this he was he again came just to collect uh, you know books and then there were some incorrect uh, disciplines within the Chinese public school so he came to kind of rectify that see what he can do uh, learn more uh, accurate methods so but he was different than Fahen and Huen Sang where he actually uh, recorded meticulous details of daily life uh, other in in addition to the to the Buddhist uh, uh, Buddhist text and Buddhist uh, thought so uh, some of the things that he um, kind of uh, recorded uh, clean and unclean food which was an alien concept everywhere and which is um, which was very much prevalent in India and, and you know use of brushing right um, uh, straining use of straining cloth uh, uh, so we all know you know back in the old days you know you in the even in the villages you, they used to strain water with a cloth around the, the matka or the pot right so in even those days they they used to have a strain cloth and it was one of the possessions or six possessions for a monk to always have so he has to have a straining cloth with him whenever he travels because then he needs to filter his own water and not filtering the water and drinking is a big no-no so all this in this covid time right is uh, bringing back all i was reading all all this and then even though this might be like you know oh this is you know, 600, 1400 year old, 1500 year old you know, stuff, we don't really pay attention to it. But if you're reading into the context, you know, you, you start to think about all this stuff. Um, so, puja before cooking food, uh, practice of nevedyam, um, you know, examining water before consumption. So, every morning, everybody used to examine water, like in wells, in ponds, even in the small bucket. If you have a water, if you see any, if they saw any, like, uh, insects fallen in, they would uh, quickly take away the water and, and fill it with fresh water so, to, uh, so that nobody gets diseased. So all these precautions that the, were there, now we have to spend millions of dollars just to ask people to wash their hands, right? <laughs> this was all, uh, so all done through uh, the practice, or so to speak, that was included as a part of dharma that one has to do every day, uh, nitya dharma. Um, uh, so one of the and and we all know about Nalanda. So Itzing actually goes ahead and 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 tells us about wealth of Nalanda. So they he saw about 300, 3,000 residents, monks, uh, studying in Nalanda, and the entire university, so to speak, was supported by two hundred villages. So endowment from two hundred villages that were around. So everybody was contributing to the. To the university. Um, some of the things that I, I found out that are very important in, in today's context and uh, physicians and merchants were honored, right? And we are all clapping for the physicians and first responders these days, right? Um, we're all uh, in a capitalist country right now, right? Merchants are honored, so to speak. Um, um, so uh, those are the, some of the concepts that, that we've forgotten or we've forgotten over the years. And under the influence of um, oh socialism and all that, so <laughs> um, so the, so the last uh, and this is where it sings uh, kind of travel of ends. Uh, uh, so I, I'll quickly go through a couple of th uh, th uh, things. So the next traveler was Heisho, uh, was from Silla Dynasty uh, in Korea, who again traveled, um, and he traveled from from South China Sea in went back to South China Sea. Um, um, obviously after that, the, and by his time, he could see that the Arabs were taking some of the control of the territory of the um, exterior, like Sindh and all that. Um, and then the book kind of refers to the uh, Khmer Kingdom, um, Kaunding and the Naga Princess story. Uh, if you don't know, uh, you should kind of research on it, figure out what, what the story is all about. It's a very fascinating story. And then um, we all know about the Korean connection to Ayodhya, right? So Elion uh, uh, and the princess from Ayodhya went to Korea, and uh, uh, there, there is a beautiful. Uh, 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 they they had built a temple or or stupa in, in Korea, which had a symbol which nobody could decipher what this was. So when the Koreans came, I think in 1974 or something, when the the, the Korean prime minister or somebody came to Ayodhya. He saw the same symbol 
on the on the mandirs everywhere in the in the town of Ayodhya. So that's how they they figured. Oh, this must have been the construction must have been from here. Uh, so there there are a lot of those stories like that. Yeah, there is a there is a lot of legends about uh, uh, you know Ayodhya princess uh, going to South Korea. Right. And, all, and uh, uh, the I think last year it was uh, the princess came to Ayodhya actually. Right. Uh, and uh, visited Ayodhya. And uh, Sanjeev Sanyal talks in detail about this and the Naga story that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. He, he devotes a lot of pages to that. So yes. in this book, actually, this is just a, um, a, a, two, a, one, a two paragraph, I think, yeah, not more than that. But uh, um, Sanjeev Sanyal's book goes into a lot of detail about it. So that brings to the conclusion of the first book. Um, anybody has questions before I begin the second? I I don't have any many slides left. About six or seven slides left after after this, and we might come uh, run through quickly. Um, uh, so, anybody has any questions? No. No, no question. Okay. All right. So um, the second volume um, that we're going to talk about for accounts. This is by Meena Chijan. Now this was this. Uh, from 8th century to the 15th century CE, and this one actually um, uh, pretty much does the uh, covers all the Arab travelogues. So all the Arabs that came along with the the conquest that happened on on the Islamic conquest that happened in India, um, and um, what what I have what I see different from and what I've done is different from from the other presentation where I kind of listed out what each traveler said because the the travel logs were few and far between and, and a lot of stuff was said by one person. Now this one, uh, in this book actually, a lot of stuff is being collated or brought together from different sources. So I'm going to do a broad theme um, and not go into specifics on, on who said, you know, or who said what and all that. So, um, we all know uh, the Arab conquest uh, started Sin, the conquest of Sin in 711. Um, uh, eventually, the, the Arabs or Muslims got in contact with Christians and then the Crusades. Um, we had a decreased contact between Europe and India after that. So once the, the Crusades started and once the, the Arab expansion started, the, 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 the trade between and the contact between India and Europe kind of ceased. Um, same thing happened. Uh, for the Buddhist monks that were coming from the Caucasus side from Xinjiang. So that that uh, travel was stopped. And so the only travel that happened after that was through uh, the Bay of Bengal and the, and the South China Sea and all that. Uh, so um, um, the Arabs actually mentioned uh, Gurjara, Pratiharas, Rashtrakutas, Palas, Cholas, and Srivijayas, right? So these are all the different kingdoms that we had at that time. Uh, Pratiharas, um, uh, Meenakshi Jain's book actually, uh, uh, Ram and Ayodhya actually writes a lot about Pratiharas and Pratiharas actually come from, uh, uh, Pratiharas means Dwarpa or, or, or a guard, right? And comes from uh, uh, Lakshman. So they, 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 they said they descended from Lakshman because they are Pratiharas or Dwarpas, the Ram's Dwarpa. So they, they were described as the fiercest opponents of, of, of Arabs or Islamic uh, conquest. Um, um, Marco Polo's brief visit to India and gradual resumption of contact with Europe. This was uh, in the 12th century. So between 7th and 12th, there was not much context. And then uh, and then after that, there was Bahamani kingdoms in, in uh, South um, and then the Vijayanagar Empire. So this book actually ends at Vijayanagar Empire. Um, So um, the earliest Arab writing that we have is from the 851 CE, uh, and this was all written by people um, after the Sindh, Sindh conquest had already happened, so about 100 years or so after. Um, and um, Arabian Nights, obviously, everybody knows, influenced by a bunch of Tantra stories. So they actually, the Arabs write about how Arabian night stories were actually influenced by the punch story because they heard stories here and then they kind of translated it and, and made it 
made it to made it their own stories. Um, the one peculiar uh, aspect that I found out was um, Arabs when they even Arabs when they had not come to conquer uh, India or they have not yet come to uh, as as an Islamic conquest, they preferred Sindhi treasures. So uh, people from Gujarat would know that Sindhis are known to be extremely good uh, businessmen, and um, them preferring Sindhi treasures was uh, is a testimony to what that community has had all these years. I mean, they were known at that time to be very good with business and money, and they are still known kind of for those attributes. Um, so, uh, and most of the stuff that what Arabs say in the book, and even the book describes is, is uh, um, justice, morality, cleanliness, dressing habits, uh, knowledge of various fields, medicine, astronomy, you know, all that philosophy. Um, all that is mentioned in this book as well. So I'm not going to repeat any of the stuff uh, that Greeks have already mentioned. Um, um, uh, what I'm going to focus on is uh, a few um, important events. Um, um, so let me go quickly jump. Um, and so we, we'll, we talked about uh, the Surya Mandir in Multan or uh, Previously known as Mulastan. Um, so, uh, Multan Surya Mandir that uh, you know, Hyun Sang uh, visited, uh, he, this was again visited by the Arabs, and, and, and they saw when well, the conquest of Sindh happened, they saw this huge mandir and huge number of visitors, and they are describing the, the, the prosperity of the mandir, how the mandir is. There is a huge garden vihar around the mandir, lakes, ponds, and everything. Uh, and pretty much every uh, mandir or idol or murti that they describe has has eyes of, of precious gems, right? So we, we even in the famous mandirs in India today, you see gems being used as eyes for for Bhagwan. So um, some of the and, and most of the stuff that I read after the, this book was was disturbing to say the least. But um, you can say being Kasim, you know, hanging cow flesh around the murtis. Uh, mosque being built in the places um, uh, of the of the same Aditya Mandir, so it was completely destroyed. The murtis were taken uh, um, and destroyed, and, and you know, uh, desecration of murtis. So uh, this is a familiar story in the entire book. Everything that they uh, describe is either um, you know uh, infidels and how they are living and how we need to kind of conquer them. And destroy uh, all their property and, and mandirs and everyone and then their way of life. So, uh, some of the the last part of the uh, uh, the half of the book was the la later half of the book was pretty much uh, conquest and in you know how things are and it was difficult to read, even though we know some of the details and uh, how things happen. It's it's tough to read all those and, and kind of not to think about uh, those times. Um, there was another mandir that was broken, which is um, in Thaneshwar or Thaneshwar, which is near Kurukshetra, Chakra Swami Temple. Um, again, the murtis were broken, um, stepped on and they were taken to Ghazni and made steps in a mosque, uh, familiar story. Um, they, they actually, the mandir said, and the raja over there, the, the, the ruler, they said they will pay you an, an annual tribute, uh, leave the mandir alone. And he said, no, you know, um, I cannot, uh, I cannot leave uh, you the ways of the infidels. I cannot do that because I am uh, holy war. So um, I'm not going to do that. So we destroyed it, captured 200,000 people. So uh, the numbers are staggering. I mean, the, the way they describe the number of people captured is is just mind blowing. Let me come to the famous Somnath Mandir. Um, I've been there a few times already. It's a it's a splendid mandir, but it was supported at that time by ten thousand villages. Now imagine Nalanda being supported by two hundred villages. And being a huge university, 
supporting uh, 3,000 monks and Somnath temple being supported by 10,000 villages. Just that's a one month there. So it was destroyed by Ghaznavi, right? We all know about that. Uh, 50,000 slaughtered. Parts of Mandir taken to uh, Ghaznavi. Estimated loot of 2 million dinars at that time. Um, subsequently, after about 200 years, Khilji again attacked Khambat, which was, we talked about the port city in Gujarat and captured 200, 2,000, 20,000 women and children. And he again broke the Somnath temple and took the murtis back and paved the entrance of Jama Masjid in Delhi. So um, this is this has happened. And so, you know, uh, difficult to read. So. And then, then the last slide I have is um, uh, the different conquests. So, uh, uh, and then the last, actually, the, the, the entire break, the last half part is, like I said, is conquest. So they they mentioned different conquerors, Pinkasin, the Ghaznavis, the Ghoris, the Kiljis, and the Timur. So um, they all um, mentioned graphic details about slaughter of, of uh, Hindus and desecration of Mandirs and Bhutis and um, we all heard about the, the story of Ra, uh, Dahir. He was a ruler of Sindh uh, and what happened to him and his daughters. Um, we all know about Ghaznavis and Ghoris. We, don't, we know about Kilji's destroying Nalanda and raids on South. Um, there is uh, this, Meenakshi Jain's another book, which is The, the Flight of the Deities. Uh, and the re, um, Flight of the Deities and uh, Rebirth of Temples which kind of goes into a lot of details about the raids on South, like Malik Kafur's raids on South and how he uh, uh, destroyed the Murtis and how the priests actually protected the Murtis by uh, digging in the ground and, and kind of putting the Murtis inside the ground and kept that as a family secret. So only the priest would know where the Murti is um, and he would pass that information from generation to generation to generation. So if you see right now, uh, the, if you follow the news, uh, the, a lot of murtis like that are coming out. Uh, even murtis from the temple complex are coming out where they would dig at a certain place and, and uh, eight or nine feet underneath the ground, an intact murti, uh, uh, bronze idol of, of uh, they uh, will come out because people have hidden them and forgotten that, uh, that it was there, you know, and now they are coming out. So um, that pretty much ends my presentation. So these are the, the, the two uh, books that we reviewed. So um, any comments, anything that I, uh, any, anyone, any, anyone who you want to add anything or any questions I, I can answer, I'd be more than happy to answer. Yeah, I was uh, about the flight of the deities book. Right. I haven't had, I have not, I have not read the book, but I have heard Professor Manaxi Jain's interview and uh, uh, presentation on that book. I think there are two series on videos available, and I'm literally, I'm not kidding you. When she talks about this, I literally cried. Right. It's so touching. Right. And I will highly recommend people to watch those. Yeah, yeah I, when I was making this presentation, I was very, you know, I, I mean, I knew some of the stuff that is mentioned in the book too, and I, we all know about them. But the first book was very easy for me, kind of, I was enthusiastic about making the presentation and all that. Um, the second one was, was tough for me uh, mm -hmm. to write all this stuff. Even writing some of the stuff on, on slides was difficult for me. So, uh, uh, yeah. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and and yeah that that book that you mentioned um, uh, even um, uh, if you know if you guys want to read there is a um, book called uh, let me show you I think uh, this was the book that I read recently um, 
It's called uh, S. Vijay Kumar's The Idol Thief. And uh, this reads like a novel. So if you want to, if you want to, I mean, it starts with, uh, it starts with uh, this, this chapter where Malik Kafur is kind of, um, you know, attacking everybody, uh, trying to find out the mandirs and root them. And it starts with the Pujari kind of going through the ritual of hiding the murtis. And this is about the Subhash Kapoor affair of how the theft of Indian uh, idols is happening, yeah. even today. So if I would highly recommend you um, read this book. Um, it's not that a big, you know, thicker book, but it reads like a novel. So you should read it. And um, um, if you follow S. Vijay Kumar, he's still kind of on Twitter. If, he's, if you follow him, he still posts um, uh, the follow-ups to this. So the, the case is ongoing where we are finding out every day the smugglers. So more murtis are being found out every day of where they are stored and how people are still smuggling them. And uh, it's just a fascinating read. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, Vijay Kumar is the co-founder of India Pride's project right, with right. Anurag Saxena. Yes. And I yes. think if I'm not mistaken, his Twitter handle is uh, Poetry in Stone. Yes. No, no, no. Poetry in Stone is a different one. Okay. Yeah, Poetry in Stone is, um, is I think, he's a um, uh, US-based, uh, or US or Europe-based uh, gentleman that works with S. Vijay Kumar. S. Vijay Kumar's uh, 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 handle is different. I, I forget which okay. one it is. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So thank you. Um, Anybody thank has you. any questions? Thank you, Shardaji, for encouraging words. Thank you, Kiran. Um, I just have a quick question on a tangent. I mean, not related to the book, but the right. conse the consequences which we faced. Uh, 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 so even the Hindu Temple Act of 1951, uh, when mm -hmm. we know that this is what the history is and right. this is what got to us, and till today we don't have any uh, set of laws or rules which can, which protects the Hindu temples, and right. uh, uh, and why is that so? Like uh, like is there a specific reason why we have been? Uh, um, like, my my understanding of is because um, it's a kind of a cash cow for um, for the government. So I, I, I remember, uh, if you know, there is a big uh, Amba Mata temple, uh, you know, uh, in Gujarat, Northern Gujarat, a huge temple, very well frequented by a um, lot of devotees. That temple used to pay salaries of Gujarat government employees when, Cong when Congress was in power in Gujarat in like 80s. Entire the, the entire salary of Gujarat government was paid through that temple. So my theory is it's a cash cow that nobody wants to let go, because advice of right now, government is controlling the temple, so they can kind of get the money out and anytime. Now it's not as much true now that because we are now op an open economy and we have much more leverage and we are kind of moving to capitalism, so to speak. Um, but in this, in the times of socialism, in the in up until 90s and even up to 2000s, that was the case, right? Like every time you needed money, you could go in into a temple and ask for money because it's controlled by the government. So, yeah, still e even today, you hear people talking about. Oh, mandir ka sona khol do, yeah. ah. chest khol do. Okay. Right. So. And uh, even today, uh, even Sri today. Tirumala Tirupati Devasthanam is the largest government institution in terms of money that generates revenue. You know, unfortunately, it, it's a temple, but it's a government entity because the government controls it. And I just wrote a, a piece about the dana in, uh, in Hinduism, and I, I came into that statistics. Mm. Yeah. Okay, does Thank anyone you. else has any questions? Sanjana Mehar Echo, Sarada's words. Thank you, Nishantiji. Thank you, Manjula. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Sanjana Meharji said that also thanks you. Uh, Sarada ji also thanks you.
Manjula ji. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, you know, um, I think we the next session uh, sometime in June. I think uh, we will yes. we'll, uh, decide what I mean, the dates. We haven't finalized yet, but yeah. Um, the, and and um, you know, um, uh, we are we are doing this so that you know we are in a certain trajectory. So like you know, the first session we did with the critical writings about India. um in uh, the 19th and 20th century and now um uh, to kind of to know all this and kind of digest that um uh, we had to decolonize our mind so that that's what the second session was and then the third session is now so we are now going to uh, progress into contemporary issues uh, going forward um and yeah, um I think next session is by me, and I'm yes. supposed to. I'll be presenting on Dharmpal's book, right? Beautiful. Awesome. Uh, Be- beautiful tree and Minakshi Ji's Sati, yeah, which is a very recent book, yeah. and it basically debunks the the theory that uh, Sati is a, was prevalent and all that. It basically says that uh, it, it was a you know the whole bogey of sati was raised by the, the colonials and the missionaries pretty much right i would love to know if untouchability was actually prevalent and when did it start if if uh, you know if it was prevalent at some point i mean i so, know it was prevalent in the recent past but mm-hmm. so um, um untouchability has a right kind of negative connotation so let me tell you something about uh, you know the the greeks um, what um the uh, some of the greeks that wrote about this and um not 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 the greeks but that, uh, the buddhists wrote about it so i think huen san wrote about it something like that where um they um there was a specific uh, uh community uh, which was called chandal okay now this chandala word is very um, you know charged word so if you if you search around and uh, in on the net you would find people who are uh, kind of trying to take advantage of the oh this was untouchability and this and that you will find lots of blogs about it but the mm-hmm. the word the, the word chandala was used for people who were hunting right and dealing with me now uh, what happened is and and if you look at in the context of uh you know covid-19 and all this where we are trying to get away from other people right we are totally. maintaining social distancing and all that so mm-hmm. chandalas in in those times because they were dealing in meat uh and 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 dead animals uh people used to uh they they were actually they people used to stay away from them because they were carried thought to be as a carriers mm-hmm. of disease so you kind of maintain a social distance not that you cannot touch them or anything like that but there was a social distance between them and the regular people in the sense that when they came into a market they came into uh, they would be people would stand not close to them but a little bit away to maintain kind of social distance so that has now i think extrapolated into oh this was they were untouchable they we could you could not touch them mm-hmm. or you know you could not uh, talk to them so to speak uh, actually the you know the trishanku story right so he was like he was uh, born satyavrata but he committed three cardinal sins namely that he flouted the father's you know the king's rules whatever mm. whatever he requested the father he was also the father he was a prince and the second was he uh, abducted a woman who was uh, getting married he was in mm. love with somebody else's wife he abducted her and then and the third was he killed a cow so mm-hmm. those were the three cardinal sins that he committed so he was called trishanku mm-hmm. and as a consequence he was banished and that is how he became a chandala mm-hmm. and the other story i know is that uh, you know the killers people who uh, were like you know basically uh, who were given uh, uh, capital punishment mm-hmm. they had they were executioners Yes. those were the chandalas who were actually like you know living outside the community right so i don't know i'd love to know when it actually became institutionalized and all that stuff yeah i mean we are we're talking about really long timeline so so within within uh within the within the the time span that we are talking about uh, mm-hmm. society is changing right i mean you you get external influences and all that so 
Um, right. Yeah, they, it's a it's a fascinating subject to find out when that was. I unfortunately the books actually don't really talk about uh, when because we are not the the main purpose of the book is not to expound on on the 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 process of what happened. You know, is they are just simply relaying the the writings of mm-hmm. uh, of various travelers. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. You briefly talked about the, you know, education in the schools and universities right. and all that. And I was, uh, I was in the process of reading some part of the Chandogya Upanishad, and it reminds me of the Satyaketu story when uh, Satyaketu, he's twelve, then his father tells me, "Hey, son, nobody has been uneducated in my family. It's time for you to go and right. study." And he comes back after twelve years. Right. At, at the age of 24 so you right. can imagine <laughs> you know the, right. the education level right so, yeah so uh, in the book actually they mentioned that um, uh, they studied till the greeks say that they the indians studied till the age of 30 yeah. and oh, wow. after, after 30 um, whoever wants to go back to the to the regular you know yes. life mm-hmm. they can go and but the others remain uh, and kind of do the PhD, so equivalent of PhD, so to speak, where they go deeper into the, to the lifelong period. pursuit. Lifelong pursuit, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If there are no the other questions, I will call it a day for this week. And uh, thank you very much, Nishanji, for a wonderful presentation. I know it was a lot to handle, but uh, you did it beautifully. So all right, we appreciate that. Thank uh, you. Thank you. And uh, you know. We will uh, see everybody next time and uh, please uh, look out for all the information on our social media and other places and we'll be posting it in the group soon once we have a speaker uh, ironed out. Okay, thank you. Have a good day everybody and stay safe. Namaste. Thank you. Bye.